Tonight on Free Minds TV, we'll be talking about the true cost of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and the only candidate at the Ames Straw Poll debate who would end those wars. We'll also be discussing a judge who sent juvenile offenders to jail for bribe money and one activist arrest here in Keene. That plus a whole lot more coming up tonight on Free Minds TV. Welcome to a brand new edition of Free Minds TV, where we challenge you, the viewer, to think outside the box. It is season six, episode 30, or the 218th regular show we have done. And as always, it's Toby here with you. And a lot to talk about, Nick. I mean, I, I want to get into the arrest and then a year later, uh, the, the, the sentencing of Ian Freeman, who was arrested a year ago for obstruction of justice, something along those lines. Yeah, I think it was obstruction. He, he stood in, the, in front of a police car um, when they were arresting people. He had planned to do it. He said the next time the police arrest someone for a victimless crime, he was going to stand in front of the police car and get arrested. Civil disobedience, I mean. Well, if that was his goal, he was successful. And he was sentenced. We'll be getting into that. Um, he's currently in jail. We'll be getting into that the second half of the show, as well as uh, a tragic story uh, that came out of Pennsylvania. We covered it a while back, I think it was well over a year ago when we talked about it, a judge who had been taking bribe money, millions of dollars in bribes, to sentence kids to uh, prison time, or to juve, juve, uh, juvie hall. Uh, this is what happens when you kind of semi-privatize the criminal justice yep. system, which we've seen with the, you know, these private, a lot of detention centers and prisons are pri private, or they're administered privately for the state. Yep. So, so there's money to be made. Took in thousands of, uh, millions of dollars in bribes and Fortunately, after over 4,000 kids were sent to jail, some of them might have deserved it, others of them definitely did not. Um, anyways, he's been sentenced, so there's some good news coming from that. But first, we've got to talk about it. It's We're still fighting three wars. A couple of them are really starting well, to... Well, I guess it depends on how you define them. I mean, okay. you could define it even more broadly than that. You could you say, well, we're still occupying 130 countries. Well, right. I mean, we still got <laughs> occupational forces in Korea and Japan. Sure. And that, they cost money, but they're not really ongoing wars. So. Yeah. And uh, amazingly enough, I mean, you'd think by now, uh, we ran, Obama ran on this what seemed like an anti-war platform years ago. And if he, you listen carefully, he, he didn't really nope, say... But it would, sounded like right. it. Definitely sounded like it. Uh, it's amazing that we're still in these wars and there's really no candidates except for the ones the media is marginalizing that would pull us out of these wars. Well, that's because peace is just insane. But it, Constant it, war is the only Isn't that crazy? The public support, public support is not out there for wars or occupation, occupying 130 countries. The public doesn't need that. It's those, but the government doesn't exist for the public, Toby. It exists these, for a very wealthy multinational corporations and politicians. Short of uh, Ron Paul, who's getting some media attention, and Gary Johnson, who's getting absolutely none, none of the Republican candidates are even talking about ending these wars. In fact, I've been watching the debates, and they're talking about doing whatever it takes to stop uh, Iran from getting nuclear weapons. Whatever it takes, that's talking about another war again? They're beating the war yeah, down Yeah, it's like, insane. Yeah? And, you know, they keep bringing up this, that a lot of them won't even really make the point that Iran's a threat to the U.S. They'll just make the point that Iran's a threat threat to Israel, and I, I don't know when it was that the U.S. military became the military of another country. It doesn't seem like our problem. Yeah. That doesn't just go for, that goes for any sure. country, and we hear these justifications a lot. Well, they're a threat to allies in the region. That sounds like their problem. Then you take out the calculator and you try to add up how much these wars cost, and the government mm -hmm. doesn't even know. It's so many no. billions and trillions of dollars that they don't even have the real no, cost. Yeah, yeah. The term close enough for government where it comes to mind. And the story I have here gets into that. Um, and they're debating, they're saying Congress has allocated $1.3 trillion for war spending through fiscal year 2011. That's just for the Department of Defense. So that doesn't count things that might be somewhat related to a global war on terror, like. Homeland Security spending or Justice Department spending, other spending that's related, um, you know, to this effort to try to, you know, supposedly go after Al Qaeda and then all the other things that fall under that umbrella. Certainly, they do go after actual terrorists. Um, a lot of other people seem to have gotten swept up in some of these Department of Justice investigations and Department of Homeland Security investigations. Uh, but it's 1.3 trillion dollars that they've allocated in special. Um, you know, line item funding for the wars. However, 
they've spent, what was it, $5.2 trillion in a base budget because the Pentagon just gets their regular annual allocation of funding. We have no idea really, no really accurate idea of out of that how much they've spent. The best estimate I see here um, puts the total spending, that $1.3 trillion plus some of their regular budget, because obviously they're spending some of that on Iraq and Afghanistan, puts the total at $3.7 trillion or $12,000 per American. I would also like to point out that if we weren't uh, fighting all these wars of aggression in other countries, if it didn't need to be spread to 130 plus countries out there, fight fight other dictators and other rulers who pose no real threat to the United States, the Pentagon wouldn't need its five point whatever trillion dollars base budget. It wouldn't be necessary well, because the, it just, we wouldn't need this giant standing army to go fight foreign wars. Right, that's certainly true. Uh, or to basically, I mean, to fight foreign wars or, um, you know, certainly troops are kept in places like Japan, Germany, Korea for strategic reasons. A thousand, I mean, site, a thousand plus bases across right. the, uh, I, the globe. Right. I mean, uh, there, you know, one argument is, well, we keep them there to contain China, which probably doesn't do much to make China feel more at ease. Um, but that's the idea, right? I mean, they really, China they're not just parking what, them there. March across I mean, the would, ocean? Right. I, I, think it's, I think it's rather silly myself, especially given our nuclear arsenal. I don't think the Chinese are going to be invading California or Hawaii anytime soon. A lot of things have changed since World War II, since Pearl Harbor. Um, but on the other hand, I think a, a part of what we do, especially when the U.S. puts troops in places like Western Europe, countries which are more than capable of defending themselves, you know, partly they're using those air bases and things to get troops to other places. And partly we're effectively just subsidizing, as I mentioned Israel before, we're still subsidizing the defense of a lot of countries that aren't the United States. Your tax money, even though we've got all this debt piling up, the U.S. credit rating downgraded, um, you know, our economic future looking pretty bleak, Washington, D.C. still sees fit to take your tax money and use it to effectively subsidize the defense of places like Germany, of Israel, of Japan. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me, Toby. It's not just like they're overreacting and allocating way too many resources to defending the U.S. They're essentially trying to act as a military for a good portion of the world. Why don't we let you know Germany and Israel and other countries that are supposed to be allies where we have bases, why don't we just let them worry about how they're going to defend their borders and we'll worry about our borders. Yeah. Meanwhile, these numbers, I want to get back to the numbers because they're so wishy-washy. It seems anywhere between one and five trillion dollars being yeah, spent they on these wars here. Estimate, so. How about the future costs of veteran affairs? All the, the thousands upon thousands of veterans coming back with blown off arms or a psychological well, there's trauma. A direct, and not to mention, I mean, there's not only the human and cost. And the cost in society of right. how many suicides are happening from this, from veterans coming right. back. I mean, you can't look at it. It's not just the budget. You're right. It's not just the VA budget. It's also the fact that you know people who are wounded, whether you know whether they've got psychological damage that occurred it's or physical costly damage. Costly on society. Right. They they may never be able to have a job. Become again. alcoholics, drug addicts. Right. A lot Not to of mention them. the the emotional. I mean, you can talk about the monetary toll. But sure. Then you can talk about the human cost. And then that has a cost on their family, which has a ripple effect to all parts of society. This isn't only affecting the soldiers who are coming back. This is affecting all of society. And I know that, for the most part, Americans have been isolated from these wars. It hasn't been since World War II, really. Vietnam, to a certain extent, when there was this uh, a draft. Uh, but for the most part, Americans are isolated. There's no more rationing of supplies going down and melting down anymore, uh, any metal to make bullets and rifles. Uh, no, we're, for the most part, Americans are isolated. Well, but we're starting to see that we're not really because those veterans come back and they are they are traumatized. They do have PTSD. They a lot of them. It's difficult to be productive members of society. So there's there are human costs, there's societal costs, and then well, the, of course all this debt and. Financial well, that's cost. the thing I was going to get to is that, no, there's not rationing taking place today, but perhaps you'd almost be better off if there was. I'm not advocating that because it's not something I'd like to see. But what I'm saying is take a look at what this debt that's been incurred to fight these wars is going to mean. I mean, take a look at what it's going to mean in terms of creating an unsustainable financial situation, perhaps leading to future downgrades of the U.S. credit rating, and what it's going to mean in terms of taxes and sacrifices and basically the loss of all that capital from the productive economy, you're going to see something 
it's, it's a lot more hidden, so it's harder to pick up on the cost. Americans feel insulated from this war, Toby, but the cost there, that $3.7 trillion that I just mentioned, was $12,000 per American. Not to mention it was money that was spent that the U.S. federal government did not have because they didn't le even levy, bother to levy taxes to pay for the war, let alone ration rubber and metal and gas. So what they've done is they've taken the cost of this war and they've pushed it off so we're really going to feel the full brunt of it in 15 or 20 years. Mm -hmm. And who knows how big the debt will be by the time the wars actually end. The expenditures in Iraq and Afghanistan are ongoing and frankly, especially in Afghanistan, there's really no end in sight, at least based on what the, the politicians in power right now and the mainstream candidates are saying. Right, and that $12,000 per American, that includes the little kids who weren't even born when the war started. Or the old people who are 95 who right. are, haven't paid taxes in 20 years right. and who are about to... You know, I don't think they're, they're going to pay gonna that money again. before they, uh, they no. they're on say goodbye. Pensioners on Social Security yep. count towards that. That's per American. If you do it per taxpayer, it looks a lot worse. Yeah. Okay, one thing you mentioned, Nick, was there's no candidate saying this. Except, no mainstream, yeah. no mainstream. Well, is that true, though? Because by the time most people are watching this, it'll be a week since the Iowa straw poll took place. Um, and you know what? I think it's kind of fitting that people are watching the show a week after it took place, because during that week, there has been a virtual media blackout on a candidate who was in within a, just less than a percentage point from taking that poll away. Ron Paul was within 152 votes, less than w votes, less than 1% from winning the Iowa straw poll, but within the last week, you would never know that he was even running for president. No, I mean, basically the coverage amounted to, you know, Bachman finished first, and this was a bit, here's the thing, is the media isn't, it's not like they're just discrediting the AIM straw poll and saying, straw polls don't matter, we're just not going to count it. They're being incredibly selective with their journalism here. And I don't see how, you know, Bachman was not necessarily, I mean, she's been a media darling, but she's not a huge force, she hasn't been to date, a huge force within the Republican Party. I don't know why it's so much more significant when Michelle Bachman wins by less than 1% than when, say, Ron Paul had won. Would they just ignore that? If he had taken first, I think it would have been harder to do. But they basically just skip over him and say who finished first and second. And, oh, well, Ron Paul doesn't really matter, even though he finished basically in a statistical tie with Bachman. And I'm not saying straw polls are not accurate in the sense that they're not a scientific poll by any means. But they do say something significant about the amount of support and the amount of organizational ability that a campaign has. And Ron Paul has a huge amount of grassroots support and organizational ability. Finishing basically in the dead heat with Bachman is something that's significant, but most news outlets have failed to cover that fact at all. They'll skip down to who finished third and fourth, but they don't cover who's in second or place. Who, and Perry, who entered the race, they covered him more right. than anything. And now Perry's a favorite? Right. I mean, He's just it, another who's George favorite? Bush. Are the media's favorite, apparently, <laughs> because people in New Hampshire, maybe they've been following this because Perry's name has been floating around for a while and they've read up on him. People in New Hampshire have no idea who Rick Perry is. They've never seen him debate because he just entered the race. How is he their favorite? People in Iowa, no idea really who Rick Perry is because he hasn't really been campaigning because he hasn't officially been in the race for more than a week. So how does he suddenly go, the guy who skips the straw poll and who people in most of the country outside of Texas really don't know at all when you're talking about your average voter, how does he go to being the favorite? And I hate to sound this way, Toby, but I really do feel like watching the last couple of election cycles, the media really tries to control to control, you know, and tell you, this is who the, these are the acceptable candidates. This is who you should vote it's, for. Pick, you know, uh, pick Mitt Romney or pick Rick Perry. I mean, I think well, how about you just report on things instead of trying to drive election you cycles? You know, it's ridiculous. I've you, been watching. Yeah, Fox News is so. Uh, well, all of them. It's not just Fox News. No, it's, it's MSNBC. Everybody. It's CNN. I was watching a couple of it's these debates. It's hard to watch these debates. I'm, I'm watching Ron Paul, the only candidate up there who's like, let's get out of these wars and not only that, let's take the troops home from all around the globe. It's amazing. You don't hear any liberal Democrats, short of Dennis Kucinich, say that. You just don't hear it. That's not what candidates say, but you hear Ron Paul saying it. The crowds applauding, cheering. Meanwhile, the moderate, moderators are rolling their eyes and laughing at him for suggesting that we bring the troops home from around the world and stop trying to be the police of the globe. And they're laughing at him. These are supposedly news people reporting the news, laughing at the, the, the idea 
of bringing troops home, not only from Iraq and Afghanistan, getting out of Libya, but also Germany and Japan and the other 130 countries. He's the only candidate saying it, and he's getting laughed at by the news people for it. I watched this one clip on Fox News who said, Ron Paul's one of the candidates at the Iowa State Fair, but if you see him, don't talk to him. Just uh, keep on going and see if you uh, can get a Bachman clip or a Sarah Palin clip who's not even announced that she's running for president. They're saying, ignore him and laughing about it. And this is supposed to be news? It's not. It's 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 very sad to watch almost because then you go and then America goes well. Why do we get more of the same? Well, you've got another guy who's essentially George Bush the third, Rick Perry, who the media is fawning over and completely marginalizing Ron Paul, the one guy who they say well we're not covering him because he's he's too fringe. He actually would change some things and shake things up. Well, isn't that what America needs right now? Yeah, and to be quite frank, I mean. I don't want to get into the, you know, campaigny wonkishness of the whole thing too much. Um, but I think if you look at places like New Hampshire, and, you know, I'm not really that familiar with Iowa's politics too much. But, you know, the Republican Party, at least in the Northeast and especially in New Hampshire, I think a lot of people, you know, including state reps and people like that who are very active in politics through the Republican Party, at least in New England, they're probably a little bit closer or a lot closer to Ron Paul in their views. And I realize some people say, well, his views are pretty extreme compared to, you know, mainstream Republicans. Well, that's okay. But he's still a fiscal conservative. He would actually cut spending and he's socially liberal, which is pretty well in line with the views of a good chunk of the Republican Party here in the Northeast. So what standard are we judging it by? Because people can say, well, Ron Paul's fringe, but he's managed to be reelected several times in Texas. In Texas. So if you're talking about a socially conservative, you know, traditional Bible pounding Republican state where the social issues are important too, it seems like he's done a pretty good job of getting reelected by the people in his district, the people who've really gotten to know him over his terms in Congress. So why is he so unelectable? He's managed to stay in Congress longer than a lot of other folks. And frankly, Rick Perry, if the media hadn't played him up so much and he didn't know he was the governor of Texas, if he had, if he had tried to give a speech at a Republican Party meetup here in New Hampshire, I don't think his viewpoints would really be anywhere near the majority of viewpoints. I think the, I think the media tries to prevent, present what's uh, mainstream and what's an acceptable viewpoint they really try to narrow it down a lot more. There's a wide range of viewpoints out there among just regular people, and but they pretty much try to force this. Well, what the, the leaders of the National Republican Party say, that's, that's pretty much what about half the country thinks. That's dumb. That's not how it works. What these rich people are being that's paid false. to say by that's corporations. False. It's it's completely ridiculous. You know, when this election cycle came, uh, started, I was like, I'm not going to focus in, and I'm not going to get upset by it. And then I see what's happening. I'm for getting rid of the federal government. They're useless as far as I'm concerned. They just give us more of the same and the same. And then I see this stuff and I just have to talk about it because it's so infuriating. Because no wonder things are going to be the same. And when we have another establishment, Republican or Democrat up there, whether it's Obama or Perry or Bachman, whichever, they're establishment candidates and people are going to complain, well, nothing's changed. We just get more of the same politician. Well, yeah, this is what's happening right now. You actually have a candidate, a couple of them, as we stated, Gary Johnson completely ignored 100%. G Gary Johnson, Ron Paul, the only two candidates who actually would shake things up being ignored that's by why the media. I think that's largely why they're being ignored. because the, That's what we that's need because, them for. Right, but, but it's because party leadership and the special interest groups that, that really bankroll these campaigns and make somebody mainstream. That's what it means. When you're mainstream, it means that big pharma and the defense contractors and everybody else will throw millions of dollars at your campaign so you can control the media space. And that's what being mainstream means. It has nothing to do with what you're going to do for the average person or for how your views line up with the average person's. It's whether you can do, and I hate to sound so cynical, and it might sound a little bit conspiratorial, but in most parts of the world outside of the U.S. where they're not so idealistic about things, and they're a little bit, they're more along the lines of realists when they look at how the world actually works. In most parts of the world, it's just understood that that's how elections work. That's how politicians work. I'd almost rather it, go back to that, Nick, because then it's at least honest. 
Because okay. this is the most dishonest thing I'm watching roll out in front of me, and it's just disgusting to watch. Well, it happened last time, too. And at least he, and Rommel before, is getting a little bit before. more coverage than he got in some of the pre... That's because he called it perfect, though. I right. mean, it's it's right. it's tough. He was essentially right. a psychic predicting the future, and if a psychic had done that, they would have given them some coverage, too. But he just is, he's calling it like he sees it. So, yeah, they have to give him some airtime for that. Plus, he has a lot of support. He has... <laughs> oh, one thing I wanted to mention before we move on from this story. Uh, Bachman won by 152 vo votes. She also bought 6,000 tickets to the Iowa straw poll. That's, um, she only got about 4,600 or something, 4,800 votes. So uh, she got about 80% of the votes she paid for. Ron Paul, on the other hand, bought about 4,000 and sold them for 10 or $20 a ticket and got um, a 4,600 or something. So he actually got more votes than he paid for. She got fewer votes than she paid for. So just something to gnaw on a little bit of who the public is actually there for. All right, moving right along, we do have some other stories we have to cover, some actual good news, a um, little bit of justice coming out of the justice system after a whole lot of injustice came out of the exact same system. Uh, this uh, longtime North, uh, Northeastern Pennsylvania judge was ordered to spend nearly three decades in prison for his role in a massive juvenile justice bribery scandal that prompted the state's high court to toss out thousands of convictions. Former blah, blah, blah county judge Mark Sevilla uh, was sentenced Thursday to 28 years in federal prison for taking well over $1 million in bribes from the builder of a pair of juvenile detention centers in a case that became known as Kids for Cash. Now, this Mr. Judge Mark Civarella Siver does not like the name Kids for Ca Cash. He says he's, he's very upset with the att Assistant Attorney General Gordon Zubrod for calling it Kids for Cash. He says... Um, he backdoored me, and I never saw it coming. Those three words made me the personification of evil. They made me toxic and caused a public uproar, the likes of which this community has never seen. Well, I'd hope so, because you know what you did? You actually took bribes. Well, you and your little friend judge here uh, took over $2 million in bribes from the PA Child Care and Western PA Child Care detention centers, extorted hundreds of thousands of additional dollars from them, to send innocent kids to prison. Yet you are the personification of evil. His lawyers say um, that he should be let off the hook. Savella, 61, uh, was tried and convicted of racketeering charges earlier this year. His attorneys has, had asked for a reasonable sentence in the court paper, saying the effect that he'd already been punished enough. His reputation had been ruined. Yeah, he might have ruined the lives of thousands of kids. How many cases were involved here? 4,000 cases were thrown out of, because of the bribery. Uh, so 4,000 cases thrown out. But he's, he's suffered enough. Not to mention that they, the other effect of his corruption, not only did he send innocent people to these detention centers, but if there were, I'm sure there weren't that many pending. But a handful of the kids might have actually been really dangerous kids who maybe did need to yeah. get away from other people. And those cases probably got thrown out too. So not only did you send a bunch of kids who didn't belong in juvie to juvie, you probably took some of the kids who, you know, walk around with switchblades and poke people with them. You probably let some of them out. So I don't know. I, I can't think of a sentence. That punished really, enough. Punished God. enough. I mean, his, his reputation Why don't we just add up all the sentences kids, that seem fishy right? and then assign them to him? That would then seem appropriate. Life in jail then, right. Nick. <laughs> that seems appropriate to me. If they, if they, so sad. Yeah, His I mean, reputation's been ruined. That's punishment enough. Yeah. It's life, sick. Life in prison's about right. Yeah. Well, at least he's going away for 28 years. That makes me a little bit happy. Well, he's 61, right? This is sick. And he, he's, he's gonna die. He's gonna. Yeah. You know, this isn't the only time this happens. This is what happens when you semi-privatize prisons or just have prisons in general. Because you build a prison in order to fill the bunks, right? You don't want an empty prison. That just costs money. It doesn't create the jobs that you have in this industrial prison, prison age. You've got to fill the beds. So you've got to have judges and laws and stuff to put people in those beds for, right? Because otherwise they're useless. What did you build the jail for? Um, this is just one case well, that highlights Judges what's going will on. say that, too. I mean, not judges, but politicians will say, well, you know, they'll, they'll push building a new, bigger prison facility because, hey, if we build it here, it'll create jobs in our community. So they're literally saying, you know, indirectly, let's send more people to fill up this prison unless you want to, I guess you could run empty prisons. 
that would yeah. solve the job. If that the jobs are the issue, you don't really have to fill them up. It but just, it basically leads to a system of incentives where they want to fill the prisons with people. So basically, they hand out sentences and arrest people in line with how many prison yeah. bunks they have. And this isn't the only reason. I know that this is a multifaceted reason on why laws are created, but it's one reason why there are all these laws on the books that create criminals out of people who have not harmed anyone. Victimless well, imprisoning crimes. Imprisoning people is a pretty poor way to sure. advance employment in a society. Sure. It's but the opposite effect. So one of the effects, though, of having these prisons is laws are created. We have this war on drugs, sending millions of people to prison every single year. Or I guess it's not millions to prison every single year. Millions arrested every single year. Many of them going to prison. Millions of convictions every single year. Some of them jail time. Some of them just fines. But anyways, you create millions of laws on the books out there that make people criminals who have not hurt anybody. Now, personally, I don't want to pay to have somebody sit in a cage for any reason unless they've hurt somebody. They've hurt someone or someone's property. There's been a crime committed. There's a victim. Then I'm happy to pay to keep them in a cage. That's OK with me. I, I get that. Dangerous people shouldn't be in society. They need to be rehabilitated. Of course, our prison system doesn't do that, but that's the thought at least, right? I'm OK with the thought behind it. What I'm not OK with is my tax dollars going towards putting people in cages who have hurt no one, who society has just deemed unfit to mingle about us, people who haven't, got, haven't gotten caught, you know, people who go to jail for drugs, uh, or people who go to jail uh, because they like prostitutes, or people who go to jail last week, we covered someone for shingling his own roof and doing it wrong. I, I mean, all these people where nobody's been hurt, they're sitting in cages, costing us all a ton of money and being taken out of the productive um, part of society. One of these people who's been a huge, um, uh, he's been a huge spokesperson for getting rid of victimless crimes is talk, host show, uh, talk ho show host Ian Freeman. Um, he does Free Talk Live, which is on about a hundred stations across the United uh, States, as well um, as being a blogger over at freekeen.com. About a year ago, he stood in front of a cop car as it um, pulled away with one of his friends behind it who had been arrested for drinking in public. Yes, another victimless crime. Um, he said that he was planning on getting arrested the next time they were arrested someone for a victimless crime. He stood in front of the cop car, as did a couple of other people. He was arrested. A year later, he's been sentenced to 270 days, I'm sorry, one year in jail, 270 days of that suspended. So in jail for 90 days. He was uh, convicted by a judge. He asked for and was sentenced to two months in jail, asked for a jury trial, convicted by the jury, uh, jury um, members, and then sentenced to 90 days in jail. So, you know, of course, the court's saying, well, we've got to definitely punish him extra for requesting a jury trial. I guess he's painted a picture for what the courts do. Yes, Nick, you were saying, well, that's what they do. That's what he'd expect. Yeah, that's what they did. Personally, I think it's a tragedy because I don't want to pay for it. It's a waste of money. Certainly a waste of money. Huge I just don't think it's very effective. I, don't yeah. th I understand the point he's banking. I don't think he made it very well to average people. Yeah, he's well, better off not getting arrested. He's gotten his message out there, and I'm sure there's going to be a lot of people moving to Keene from this and donating money to the people, cause. So the one way or the other. 25,000 people in Keene don't react to it well. We are out of time this week. Thoughts and the comments, freemindstv.com. Until next week, it's been Toby here with you. And Nick. Have a good night.